thank, thank you so much for having me. Um, the topic, as you can see, is hospital medicine, which happens to be the newest specialty in medicine. Um, and ironically, it is 22 years old as of last month. So most, do, most many still ask, what is a hospital? And instead of reading this to you, this is from our national organization, SHM has defined it. I pretty much explain it as a physician whose primary responsibility is hospitalized patients. With that comes a great breadth of responsibility as well, not just the delivery of medical care, which we will talk about a little bit. And also to frame this talk, if there are any questions, if anything pops up, just shout it out. So this could be more of a dynamic interaction, a conversation versus a lecture. Obviously, this is dear to my heart. Um, out of training, I became a hospitalist not 22 years ago, or 20, getting closer, it seems like. Um, and I started a program in Nashville right out of training. So I finished residency, I was a little older when I went to medical school, but I stepped right into developing a program in Nashville. I'm not from New Hampshire originally, but my wife is, which is why I'm here. So. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and a lot of this history I've got to be part of. So from a historical perspective, the term hospitalist was actually coined in 1996. And it was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Walker uh, and Goldman. They were at UCSF in California. And they actually wrote this article to define these changes that they're seeing in healthcare. And they coined the phrase hospitalist. That's when we finally got our name. I would argue that if you go back before 96, if there are physicians in the room, you may remember an era where you were doing both, which still happens on occasion. And in group practices, and I lived this in residency, we had a wonderful internal medicine group of five doctors, but they lived they didn't live, their practice was five to seven miles down a very busy road from the hospital. And so their model was to have four of their partners in the office at all times, and one partner became their hospitalist for the week. So they had already solved this problem back then, and it tends to be a factor of distance and volume with additional pressures in healthcare that we can talk about. A year after this, was, this phrase was coined, our, our first national organization was formed in 97, and it has a somewhat painful name to say all the time, National Association of Inpatient Physicians. That's what they named themselves initially. And when I joined the organization, it was the last year where we used this name. And in 2003, it became the Society of Hospital Medicine. And there was a reason for that, and that was the explosion of this new practice of medicine of hospital medicine or hospitalists. Here's a few numbers to take a look at. It, it is historically the fastest growing specialty that we've known in medicine. So back when the phrase was coined, there were only about 100 hospitalists in the nation that only practiced inpatient medicine. In 2003, when we changed our name, there were 11,000. At the 20 year anniversary of the organization, there are 44,000, and now probably in this year, there are well over 50,000 nationwide. So there was this rapid explosion of hospital based physicians or hospitalists. At the same time, if you think about the hospitals throughout the US that actually needed, I shouldn't say needed because they, I think they all did, but those who were using hospital based physicians. When there were 11,000 of us, only 29%. Four years later, 50%. Two years ago, 72%. I'm not sure what the data is for 2018. But this became, I think, the major driver for this. The need for hospitals to have aligned physicians that were in the hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week, providing care to the acute and sick patients in the hospital. So the formalization of this specialty 
actually, as I just mentioned, our National Society in 97, then renamed in 2003. There is now a focused board certification through internal medicine, ABIM. And this happened, I would guess, about seven years ago was the first test. But it is an internal medicine board specialty with a focus. The exam is, is a focus in purely hospital medicine. And I have taken this test. I was initially board certified in internal medicine and have since focused my practice because it's what I do 100% of the time. I have taken this exam, um, which just focuses purely on the acuity of illness and the pressures of hospitalized patients. Now our residency programs, the training programs of new physicians that are coming out, they're catching up with this pressure. with the pressures of hospitals, the volume that we're seeing, if I go back, we're keeping up with these numbers here, the demand. And our residency programs are now bifurcating. Internal medicine, you can now, in many programs, not all programs yet, you can um, join a program and go into an outpatient-focused residency or a hospital-focused residency. The two main training programs for um, hospitalists, it's primarily internal medicine, but more and more family physicians are hospitalists as well. And they have a one-year fellowship after their family medicine that then focuses purely on hospital medicine. We have a new partner that just started this month. She trained here in her residency, went away to South Carolina, did a focused one-year fellowship, and has joined us this, this month. So it was fun to welcome a new partner, but who is now making a commitment in her practice to hospital medicine. Any questions, please? Ah, uh, here. Could you repeat the question for the- Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, the question was how many hospitals do we have here at Concord Hospital? I believe we currently have, and it's a moving, moving target, we currently have 22 physicians, and I believe, anywhere from 12 to 16 um, what we call advanced practitioners or nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Our department's about 40 strong, we told. And I would argue that even with that number, we can't provide all of the service that the organization might need or want from us. So why? Why the pressure? Why this rapid growth? This gets to your question of why we have so many or why we don't have enough, even though our numbers seem rather large. So what are the pressures? What drove this rapid expansion over the last 20 years? What caused the paradigm shift? So we have, we have physicians in the group that were internists, family docs, even specialists. You would remember you did both. You did it all, right? You took care of them in the office. You took care of them in the hospital. Specialist, office, hospital, back and forth. One of the major drivers, at least in the West Coast, was this, managed care, which is, which is a high prevalence on the West Coast. It, it's on the East Coast, but the West Coast, it's, the prevalence is, is through and through. The pressure was for increased patient volume, decreased expenditures to do it with less money, less cost, see more patients and do it in a shorter cycle. Not a great formula. That pressure happened in the office. That pressure happened in the hospital. Two at the same time, and the physicians who were doing both felt the pressure on both sides. And what we really needed was physicians who had a complete focus in one arena. So we had two arenas that required 100% focus and one doc doing it at the time just was not manageable. So as I mentioned that in my training, the physician group of five internists who had figured this out, they designated one of their partners to not see patients in the office, but rather focus in the hospital while the other four managed the office efficiently. That has now become a formalized process, which is where hospital medicine has come from. In, in Nashville, when I was developing the program, the ratio back then, and this was over a decade ago, 
I represented about six to eight primary care docs. So it was about one to eight-ish as we were developing the program. Um, I think the, the ratio may be a little higher now, I'm not certain. Um, our presence in the hospital allowed for easier recruitment in the office because you weren't having new physicians come out with the expectation that they were have to, there would have to be two specialists, a specialist in the office, a specialist in the hospital. As soon as we took over that responsibility, and I'm assuming the same thing happened here, it made it easier to recruit primary care to take care of the office, the specialized patient in the office. By the way, who's getting more acute, the acuity is getting higher in the office, the acuity is getting higher in the hospital, hence the need for two separate types of physicians to take care of those patients. So that's part of the paradigm shift. This rapid expansion, I, I break down healthcare into decades because I felt different pressures in different decades. Early on, it was the managed care. It was this decreased cost, increased turnover, um, move patients through more quickly. We're still feeling that, by the way. Then in the, at the turn of the century, there was a huge quality safety initiative. Nationally, many of you may remember this, um, you may remember the article to error is human. And they started to do studies to find out how many medical errors were being made, what kind of effect that had on our patients. And the only thing that I remember is the, the correlation that it was the equivalent, according to this study, of about one jumbo jet crashing per day. So with that, there was this huge pressure in the offices but more so in the hospitals with the high acuity of patients to change how we deliver care, focusing on safety. And safety really drove the quality concept of what we did. We've now moved that this has become, this has become sort of bread and butter. We all live this day in, day out. Now there's additional pressures in this decade for efficiency, for throughput, moving patients through the ER and into the hospital, getting them out of the hospital in a timely fashion, shortening that acuity cycle of being in the hospital and then back out to the primary care. And the primary care physicians are now receiving patients that have a higher acuity of illness, multiple comorbidities going on, so multiple medical issues at the same time. And what they're seeing in their daily management in the office, the acuity has gone up, what we're seeing in the hospital, because of technology and medical advances, the acuity is going up. So it's been a very interesting paradigm shift to live through, um, but I believe it is the alignment of hospitals and physicians, specifically hospitalists, where hospitals have seen the solution, so to speak, with these different pressures. We live in the hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not individually, personally, but as a group, we hand off and we cover the hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So we are always here responding to oftentimes patient needs, as well as family needs and hospital needs. So those, th those three things sort of drive us through the hospital while we're dealing with the acuity of the medical issues. Any thoughts, questions? Right. Continue on here. Currently, what do we have in the hospital? Here in Concord, we've got an adult hospitals program, we've got a pediatric hospitals program, we now have an acute care surgical team, a trauma team, and there's now training for surgeons, for acute care surgeons. It's a new training program. They essentially function as hospitalists in the surgical realm. Many places now have neurologists who function as just inpatient neurologists. We have OB, They're now called laborists, I think. Uh, that keeps yeah. changing. Nocturnists? We have nocturnists here. But I thought, our, I thought our laborers were not turned. They might be. And that is, again, the pressures of the hospital um, and a physician group responding to meet the needs of the hospital. If you, and our 
OB colleagues impress me to no end because they would be in the office seeing their patients. They would be up all night long waiting for those babies to be born, sometimes in the OR, back in the office the next day. Um, and for safety reasons, for the physician and patient, it's just not sustainable. The acuity keeps going up, the volume keeps going up. So they have, they have um, mirrored, so to speak, the hospital-based care model to meet the specific needs of OB patients. All of these are happening in real time. There's some others. Other surgical specialties have now come up with this model, and it's all the pressures of the hospital, pressures of medical practice, and the inability of doing both inpatient and outpatient. Yes, ma'am. I, I have a question. Just <clears throat> my primary care physician, any of the times that I've been in the hospital and hospitalized, um, always seems to be there. And is that by his choice or? Probably. Yeah. Which is a wonderful choice. When yeah. I started in Nashua, I was actually recruited, even as an intern, so I was recruited by the family medicine program yeah. because their offices just geographically were farther away from the hospital and the logistics of getting in and out um, and the needs of the one patient in the hospital outweighing the needs of a, of a waiting room full of patients. They were motivated towards this program. Internal medicine, historically, and I'm not saying universally, historically, tends to be closer geographically to the hospital because those patients are older patients. Internists don't deal with pediatrics and OB and, and the, the subset of patients who don't tend to be acutely ill as much. How's that for a statement? Um, so they tend to be closer because most of internal medicine patients have a higher percentage of hospital patients. They can make it back and forth. And when I started again, it was the family medicine division that was, that was driving the development of the program. After it was up and running, the internal medicine quickly joined in. They had to wait for recruitment um, to allow that to happen. But if your physician still does it, as they did when I started, I was working side by side with them, which was wonderful. Even though I was taking care of many of their patients, I couldn't do it all. As we, <coughs> excuse me, as we developed and grew, they were in the hospital less and less. There are several physicians here at Concord that still, that still do their best to see patients in the hospital, and there is no substitute for your primary care physician when you don't feel well. I'm not the one you want to see coming through the door. Um, although many patients have accepted it over the years, um, oftentimes early on I got asked that question, where is my doctor? Why aren't they here? And I would explain this to them, and my answer was always, I believe you may be the exception to the rule. Most patients, when they came into the hospital, didn't end up seeing their primary care doctor. They saw one of their partners because nobody can be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So oftentimes you would see a partner and they would think about it and agree with me. Um, so there was always a model where somebody else was available to cover when your primary care physician wasn't available. The hospital's movement has become this formalized coverage in the hospital. And in National Week, there was an internist who still enjoyed doing both. And my feeling was, continue to do it. <clears throat> Tell me how much you can do. That's how much you can do to maintain your quality of practice, quality of life, so that you can continue to do what you love to do. And we will take the overflow. He said, wonderful. I think his was three patients a day, up to three patients a day. He had a fourth patient that we took over for him. But that allowed him to be in and out of the hospital and still doing both that he enjoyed so much and to keep his skills up. So. Um, very fortunate if your physician still wants to do that, extend themselves, which is wonderful. We have, again, as I said, two in this organization that still do it. Um, and we are their support when things get crazy, if there's too much work, they're away on vacation or um, education, time away, things like that. Any other questions, thoughts? I would like to go back and talk about, oops, 
motion. Some of these pressures, because this is what not all of us are good at understanding while we're living it. There are a lot of pressures from different areas. So I think physicians who want to maintain their practice was a pressure early on for hospital medicine. Specialists were a pressure early on. They thought that they were going to lose volume, work, something. So our specialty um, surgeons and, and, and medical physicians pushed back early on. Primary care pushed back early on, except those that were far enough away from the hospital that they clearly saw the benefit and were willing to turn that over. Um, early on, we sort of modeled after the pulmonary critical care docs, because they were in the hospital, in the ICU, and they had very similar models to what we were doing and what we now do in hospital medicine. The other model early on was the training programs. In residencies, in training with physicians, you would often have an attending come in for a week, a month, and be on the teaching service. So you had a senior physician with those in training, teaching um, and educating through the process. Primary care physicians in that environment quickly found that if they were only doing this once a, once a year, maybe twice a year, they didn't feel like they could stay up with medicine enough to be a instructor and a teacher for those of us coming through and learning only the new stuff. We didn't know the old stuff, right? We only knew what was in front of us at the time. And so the original article by Goldman and Walker, they were in a teaching program, and their paradigm shift was, how do we do a better job at teaching our residents? That's what drove this originally. They were very aware of then the secondary pressures for specialty medicine, for uh, surgical service and other, other areas within the hospital. That historically was um, a concern that never played out. Uh, when I started, again, I'll go back to, I can speak personally in Nashua, the primary care docs did a good job, but they were in, in the morning before office hours, or they would come at the end of the day. And they were relying heavily on specialty services to help fill in the daytime management. When I arrived, my planning, I, I did a lot of thought as to how many physicians I thought I needed to provide coverage in this size institution, and I came up with a number of six. Before I got two, I needed eight. Before I got four, I needed 10. When it was all said and done, I needed 16, and I was still looking for four more. Because the shift of the consultant's world, they didn't lose any work. Their work shifted a little bit. I took my medical management to my limit, and they were there to then allow it to go the next step. And there was plenty of work. Volume in the hospital shifted. It went up. I think everybody became had a greater satisfaction in their practice because they were now practicing medicine the way they were trained and what they wanted to do. Um, so it was an early concern. <coughs> Excuse me. It did not play out over time. Um, and really, the pressures of these issues on hospitals really are what drove the recruitment of hospitalists and all of the other specialties that I mentioned that are now involved in hospital care. Those pressures are very, very powerful because with the, shrink, the shrinking healthcare dollar, uh, physicians have become aligned with hospitals. They found a partnership there. And hospitals now have physicians that can think in terms, and the newer hospitals are actually trained in quality, trained in safety, and they're much younger even than I am, and much better at the technology. And they are those partners that hospitals need to meet the external pressures in real time in a hospital. Um, what I do know, I used to say all the time, even in residency, that my medical knowledge may not have been, have been that much greater than the residents that I was teaching, even a year behind me. What I do know, what I knew then, and what I know now, 
is that in the hospital as a resident, as a second and third year, I understood the workflow in the hospital far greater than an intern in a, res in a second year resident could. I knew who people were, I knew where they hid, I knew what they did, I knew when they liked to go home, okay? And I could navigate this complicated system called the hospital with greater ease and more efficiently than they could. So case in point, in Nashville, I still remember this, this and forgive me if I, if I tell stories of my experience, but I had a young lady, and the older I get, the younger she is. She was in her early 30s. She came into the emergency room with abdominal pain. And it was about 3 o'clock-ish, that witching hour, right? And things start to happen, and you lose resources that you have at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. Abdominal pain, she got a CAT scan that showed an abnormality in her stomach area, some edema. Couldn't tell me any more than that. I went in, I spoke to her. I got a history that was clearly consistent with a gastric ulcer which I could then explain by the CAT scan. And this is now about quarter to four by the time I've gotten all this done. And my first step was not to do paperwork, was not to put in orders, but I picked up the phone and I called 2940, by the way, which even back then was the endoscopy suite, because I knew at four o'clock, their last case ended, and everybody left the building. So I had 15 minutes, and I got the nurse, and I said, who's on, who's the doc on? And she told me the name. I said, please don't leave, please don't leave. She said, okay. That was my first request. My second request was, can I talk to the doc, the gastroenterologist? I said, I need someone who has to have an endoscopy. That's the next appropriate step in the management of this young lady. She hadn't eaten since the day before because she was having so much belly pain. I had no barriers. She went from the ER to the endoscopy suite, got scoped in less than 15 minutes, by the way. They were waiting for her up there. They whisked her out. While they were finding my answer for me, I was doing the paperwork. She wound up back on the floor with a diagnosis, biopsies, a plan in place, and she went home the next morning. Everything wrapped up. And the only reason, and I did nothing different than a primary care doctor would have done in the hospital. I simply managed to do it in very, very compressed time cycle. That's all. Because I knew where people hid, I knew when they left, I knew phone numbers, I knew routines, and that was the ability to get that done more quickly. And that's what the hospital is now relying on those of us who spend all of our time. I tell patients all the time, this is my office. Right? In, the, in a physician's office, it runs smoothly. Right? They've figured out their efficiency in the office. I just have a bigger office. More staff. I've got to learn more. I'm not here all the time. It seems like I'm here a lot. So, but that's the difference. And, and, and that example was a unique situation because I had everything lined up and I had a narrow window to make a decision. That happens in variations day in, day out. Um, and those who've been practicing for longer remember the days when we kept patients in the hospital for long periods of time. So I used to hear tales when I first started of heart attacks that stay in the hospital for weeks, right? And on day three or four, you would let the patient dangle their feet off the bed. And on day seven, you let them stand. And on day 10, you would allow them to walk down the street, I mean, down the hallway, right? That's right. Now, now, if you get your medicine, you go to the cath lab, and you're walking around when you come out, right? Okay? That's the heart attack these days. They're in and out, and, and before the old patients used to dangle their toes. We got this patient back home with follow-up in the primary care physician's office and with the cardiologist, obviously. So there's so much that has changed, and it is, it are, it's these pressures that are driving the healthcare dollar, that are driving hospitals, that are driving physicians, that are making this happen in 22 years. It's amazing what's happened just in that short period of time in healthcare. Dr. Fulton, so, so somebody presents to you as a hospitalist, and you actually don't have the benefit of their history or of knowing them. Right. How do you fill those gaps? Because oftentimes, what's being presented in front of you May have may have been building or, right. or whatever. How do you <coughs> grasp that information quickly, having not had a long-term relationship right. with the patient? That's when I'm very envious of the primary care physician who can walk in and has all of that history inside of 
already. And they don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, as we do on that first interaction with a patient in the hospital when they're feeling the worst, when they're acutely sick, when they need someone the most to help them and shepherd them through this. Um, it takes a lot of work up front to gather that information. Um, it's actually a little easier for me as a physician, a hospitalist, than the next most recent specialty in, in medicine, and that's emergency medicine. They have even less information than I do. I get to build off of our ER physicians who have to gather information with, sometimes their patients can't even talk to them. They're literally working with zero information. They build a little bit. I'm usually taking over for the emergency room physician. But now that we have an electronic record, that becomes a little easier, a little more streamlined for our patients, but it happens quite frequently that um, New Hampshire is still a destination spot and people get sick on vacation. And or we've got snowbirds. We only have half of their record, right? Their other half is in Florida. Um, and so it is, it takes more energy to one, build a relationship, two, gather information in order to take care of the patient in real time. There's no doubt about that. It's heavier lifting for us early on. The flip side is we get them out more quickly. The responsibility then becomes, since I have acknowledged in the past that I am part of the fragmentation of healthcare, right? You've inserted another physician in the continuity of care. My obligation and responsibility is then communication with the next person that I hand off to, most commonly is the primary care physician. Does that answer your question? It does. Yes. yes uh, how, how often do you rotate? Is the number of hospitals you have? How many days do you work in off for 24 hours? So there are different models. So now we're into the schedule of a hospitalist life. Every hospital has a different model because every hospital, while it has all the same components, it has an ER, it has an operating room, it has radiology, it has medical floors, they got all the same stuff. The pressures, the pressures are different for each institution. And so the hospitalist schedule tends to adapt to the unique needs of the hospital. And ours have, the, the group here, it is, there's a, it's not quite a week on a week off. So there's no good answer to, to that question. But it's typical for us to work seven days in a row when we're rounding on patients. Those have been admitted to the hospital and need daily management to get them out as efficiently as possible. And that seven days maximizes our opportunity to start with them early in their hospitalization and transition out of the hospital, hospital and get them back to their primary care physician. It doesn't always work that way. Because of it, there are the perfect storms that I described where you see three doctors in two days. And that's not good, but it is a, a give and take. But we typically round for seven days in a row for continuity purposes. When we're admitting patients in, in the hospital through the ER, it's an initial patient encounter, so there's really no continuity. So we tend to do shifts a couple times a week when we're just admitting, when we're rounding, we try to be available on the floors for seven days in a row. 24-7? The group is 24-7. Okay. okay. I've, What's your I've, shift? I'm sorry. How long is the shift? The shift. My answer is always until the work is done. <laughs> right? There's a time when you can go home, and there's a time when you actually get to go home. And it depends on the patient's needs. Yes. Um, typically, rounding, it's it starts at about eight hours. It can go dot, 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 until the work is done. Um, admitting shifts, because of the intensity of it, we limit to nine to ten hours. And you always have someone that you're handing off to. Yes, sir. And from what I've heard, the issue, one of the issues with hospital medicine is, as you mentioned, communication. Getting the patient's data from the primary care, which technology itself, uh, 
passing that information from you to the fellow who takes over in the afternoon to the person who's on nights to the person the next morning, and then getting that data back to the primary care doctor. And apparently, there have been some tragic incidents where that communication fell apart. Yes, <clears throat> and how, how do you try to manage that to optimize that? So with the new electronic record, it's wonderful because I've never been in the office. I've never been a primary care physician. I've worked with them and talked to them a lot, and I hear little tidbits. They love the new electronic record because they see what I'm doing every day. They know when their patient's in the hospital, and they look and follow what's going on in the hospital. So they're not unaware. And that's just our group. That's the medical group, the medical group that has access to that. It is very difficult. In the 24-hour period, there are multiple handoffs, as you just alluded to. We have an electronic sign-out, and there's still verbal communication. So we verbally sign out every day to our partner who's going to then be covering us in the overnight hours. So there's verbal communication, there's written communication. That transfer to the primary care is in written form in the form of our discharge summary. Sometimes it also includes you pick up the phone and you call them because there's something that you can't put in paper. You don't have the time, but there's some concern. Absolutely. Does that answer your question? It is imperfect. The error is human, and, and pieces of the puzzle do fall over time with the quality and safety focus. We try to identify those so that we're better tomorrow than today. That's the best I can answer. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Bob Stuff. So I'm on the outside. I'm the pharmacist. I get your discharge. Oh, okay. A lot of times on a Saturday or Sunday. So yes. I have a question. One of the issues we find. And you're right, they're coming up with higher acuity. We handle a lot yes. of skilled patients that come to yes. our We run into issues with prior authorization. Mm -hmm. One of the issues is, is that hospitals historically have passed that from the off. They yes. haven't wanted to deal with that. So there's a delay now. We have to reach out to the primary care physician who hasn't had the information passed on to them. Yet. Yes. I'm wondering, as your role is grown, now it almost looks like this is a a piece of the hospital whole department. It is. Have you given consideration for that piece? Have you looked at prior authorizations of maybe having something to help you handle those patients with my city? Yes. Um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a dilemma because it's the paperwork side. It's the busy side of medicine that is overwhelming our office partners. It also overwhelms us to a certain extent. Um, we are better, we're, we're trying to be better. And it, it, again, it's an imperfect process that you want to be better today than yesterday, and better tomorrow than today. To identify those resources in the hospital that can help us with those. The one that used to drive us all mad was vancomycin, which is an antibiotic that we use for various infections, but the tablet form was incredibly expensive and universally no insurance would pay for it without justification with prior authorization. And if you try, if I tried to send them out on a Saturday without prior authorization for something that they need to take, they needed to take that evening, it was a nightmare. An absolute nightmare for everyone, for the pharmacist, for the hospitalists, for our case managers. And what we're learning to do is identify those meds, just like we, in this quality focus and safety, we've identified high-risk medications in the hospital that always need to be thought of differently than the Tylenols, the ibuprofen, and the dot, dot, dot. All right? That you never want to order without thinking first. And so we're sort of thinking in that way about the discharge process as well. Because that charge to us, that challenge to our practice of medicine, is to hand off as seamlessly as possible to the next person in line who will collect them. In Nashua, um, we developed what was what we called a transitional care program. So there were nurses embedded in our group that focused on a lot of this stuff. And they would hang on to the patient after they left the hospital. I used to say that I had this panic attack. We had a, we had a revolving door in Nashville in the, in the front lobby. 
And I would say every time my patient goes through that revolving door, I have a panic attack because I'm, I'm losing control. I can no longer manage them as soon as they hit the outpatient world. And the care coordinating program allowed me to reach out and still manage prior off. Questions of insurances keep changing their formulary. So one medicine that they will pay for today, <clears throat> next week they will swap it out for another one. And you, and you can't, you try to keep track of it, it, it drives you mad and it, you know, it's even worse for me. So all of those, I'd send them out on one antibiotic and I now had someone who could take a call and say, we need it switched over to, I said, fine, I need them taken care of, I need them on antibiotics. If you can't have this one, then here's the, the next option that I'm going to use. So that's how we've tried in the past, and we're trying to develop that here as well. But that is a very complicated piece. This right here, most of the safety issues, the majority of them historically were centered around medications. Yes, absolutely. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Can I personally initiate treatment? You have to refer to uh, the primary care or surgeon or something. You can't, uh, you can't decide anything. You don't treat the person directly. In the hospital or outside the hospital? In the hospital, I am their primary care physician here in the hospital, and I am their attending physician. So I'm I'm dictating and driving all of the management in the hospital. When they leave the hospital, if there is management that I feel like they need, I have I'm having an easier time now that historically I could not reach out and initiate care after they left the hospital. It would have to fall on the primary care physician to follow through on a plan that I had started, unless they disagreed with it, if they knew the patient better, then they became responsible for the next step in the healthcare process to then manage the patient. But in the hospital, I I represent, I'm the, the primary care equivalent in the hospital with a specific focus and training on doing it as efficiently in this office that I call Concord Hospital as possible. Do you uh, identify yourself as an event to the patient? I do. I do. <clears throat> Early on, I would say that, that, that I am Dr. Smith's representative. It was a female physician in Nashville, and I would often say that I'm, I'm Dr. Geary. And they would laugh at me because they knew, obviously, I wasn't Dr. Geary. But after the chuckle, then I would say I'm taking over for her in the hospital and when you leave you're going right back to Dr. Geary whom they love dearly so oftentimes I would call Colleen to come in the hospital because her patient needed them to see her so she would come in sometimes she would drop drop a note sometimes she wouldn't but then that working relationship was very cohesive she was one of the original physicians that helped recruit me so I got to work with her from day one so actually that's what Thinking about some of your responsibilities in your question, would you support universal health coverage? Right? So you're not, someone in your staff must be looking at is this, does she have insurance covered for this hospital visit? You wouldn't have to be worried about what, what was covered when they leave. The beauty of my practice of medicine in Concord Hospital has the mission provide care to the community, regardless of their ability to pay. It's that I get to put my blinders on. Okay. And I look at everybody the exact same way. That is a Concord Hospital's responsibility to meet their mission, my mission as well because I'm part of the organization, to meet that mission to care for all patients independent of their ability to, to pay. But when it comes to reimbursement, Certainly, the hospital looks to our group, as well as all the other physicians, how to manage the shrinking resources appropriately. So that's the other challenge to quality and safety, this driver early on for managed care. How do you manage your resources appropriately in this increasing acuity 
patients are alive longer. They stay around longer and longer to develop, to develop more medical issues. I got to take care of a very snappy 94-year-old lady recently. It was absolutely a pleasure. And I found out she was an old, she was an old Navy nurse, and it all made sense. It was, it was wonderful, wonderful. Um, so, again, our longevity is there. The medical technology and management is increasing, and our patients are around longer. So that is our charge, though, to, to manage the hospital's resources. As, as widely to be, to be good stewards of that. Yes, sir. Is the ultimate objective of the hospital's program to eliminate the primary care physician's involvement while a patient is hospitalized? I wouldn't say that that's an end point. Um, just like the two primary care physicians that still come into the hospital, I appreciate that dynamic more than most. It's so important. Um, and I've apologized many times throughout my career for not being their primary care when they needed their primary care the most. And that's when I walked out and picked up the phone and called them and said, I need some help. You know, we work together, but your patient needs you sometime today. I can't tell you when you're gonna make it. And I would never, I always say, I'm not sure when your primary care doctor is gonna show up. But I have a feeling in the next 24 hours, you may have a visit, right? So it's never to eliminate that. The realities are that the demands in the hospital are so high that primary care physicians are becoming more and more aware that it is a specialty in medicine to manage in the hospital. And they don't feel comfortable to, to be able to meet that standard. And I can't speak for all of them because two of them still come in the hospital and do a very good job. But many, especially that have practices geographically that are farther away from the hospital, have made that decision. They need to manage their fill-in-the-blank number of patients per day that are filling up their waiting room instead of that one or two patients that are acutely ill in the hospital. But it's not our goal to replace them. It's just been, it's been again, the pressures that have driven this fragmentation, the hospital-based, office-based. Both areas, both arenas are so much more complicated than they were when I started decades ago. Yes, ma'am. Exactly what I was saying, that it's really developed because of the pressure on the internal medicine physician because acute episodes don't just happen early in the morning and late at night before they're going home. I mean, if you're in the hospital and someone you know, has a stroke or yes. you know, has a heart attack, practice I'm well aware that if I'm here till five in the evening my patients don't always have their deterioration while I'm here so I can manage them during the day and they seem fine or I'm concerned yes. and that's when I pull my partner aside who's covered me who I'm handing off to and say this person's concerned something I don't know exactly what's going on but something is going on and I need you to keep eyes on them and I talked to the nurse as well. I'm concerned about this patient. Here's my partner that's taking over very shortly. And we tighten that communication up. And it, ha it has happened many, many times. I've been on the receiving end, covering in the evening. I've been on the giving end as well, where, where I'm communicating with the partner. Because with that shortened cycle, the acuity is going up. We're in the hospital for less time. More things are happening and or you're seeing them as they're deteriorating. People are getting sick in front of you. And that's, that can be intimidating, but we have a lot of resources in the hospital. And I would have to say that the best strength that any clinician can have is to know when to ask for help. Or to know when to ask for nothing else. I don't know what's going on. And I've said that many times to my consultants. I don't know what's going on, but I need you to look at them Tell me if it's in your area of expertise or do I need to call somebody else? Within the last few months that's happened, by the way. Two specialists, one showed up and said, this is not my area of expertise. 
but this is what you need. I said, how'd you know? She said, well, you were managing my specialty perfectly fine, and they weren't getting any better. But they looked at everything I'd done, I, I thought they had some sort of magic, you know, in addition to what I was doing. If the answer is no, you did it all, look over in this arena. And I did, and I had my answer. Absolutely. I, I know that your um, relationship with the primary care physician is one of partnership, you know, together in many ways you're caring for that patient. But when push comes to shove, in the hospital, it's your decision as a hospitalist, correct? To manage the patient? Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. It becomes my responsibility. They're my patient now. And I'm charged with that shortened cycle of dealing with this very acute patient. Um, and most primary care physicians simply add information historically. They don't, they don't challenge what we do. I think they're grateful for it. Um, for those of us in medicine, you, you were very aware, as I am, of how imprecise some things are because of the human body and the complexities of it. Many times in the hospital, I have to tell my patient when I'm discharging them, they say, well, what was wrong with you? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> right? I don't know. You're better. They say, they just, I get a blank stare. Say, you came in sick. My problem is 95% of the time, your body heals itself, right? We don't spend our lives in the hospital. We get sick, we get better for some strange reason. The body fixes itself. That continuum of patients getting better, you can also flip it. It's the continuum of the patient getting, I mean, the patient getting worse, you can flip it, the patient getting better. Well, I'm trying to figure it out. Your body's fixing it for me, right? So then I have to say, all I can say is I'm, I, I'm just grateful that you're getting better and not getting worse, right? They fix themselves, I have to send them home without a diagnosis, without an explanation, and they follow up with a primary care physician. Yes. And that's mainly a factor of the fact that that cycle keeps getting shorter. Not only do we have to discharge them in, in, in fewer days, we have to discharge them earlier in the day. Right? We have to get them into the hospital more quickly. We can initiate care, we can get them out more quickly. And it's all, these external pressures have driven this rapid cycle um, increase in hospitals and um, all of the different types of hospital-based physicians. Any other question was, is it actually better for the patient if I'm, that the hospital involved, is involved versus the primary care physician? Um, ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, is it actually better for the patient? And there's no right or wrong answer for that. I believe they get better acute hospital care because this is all I do and this is what I'm trained in from a emotional, psychosocial standpoint, maybe not because I'm not Dr. Geary, okay? I'm not the primary care physician and that's who all of us wanna see. We wanna see a familiar face when we don't feel well. And although there's enough cycling in and out of the hospital with some patients that they know me very well. <laughs> you so, are their friend. Dr. Pult, one last question. So, you know, you talked about, you know, getting people into the hospital quickly and getting them out of the hospital quickly. I don't want anybody to necessarily have a misunderstanding that we're trying to push people out of the hospital, but there's a real reason why we don't want them here for a long time. Could you talk about that? I absolutely would, and this is, uh, you're hearing a lot of the things that I say to my patients. Um, when they're better, when the patients get better, and we're doing a better job at intervening quickly with more aggressive interventions, so patients are getting stable more quickly, you actually want to get them out of a hospital. 
oftentimes I'll tell them, I've got to get you out of the hospital before you actually get sick. Right? We fixed one problem. <laughs> you hang around here too long, right? We got four walls and a bunch of sick people in it. And you run the risk of actually getting sick. Um, the other thing that we cannot do in the hospital, because we deal with acute medical, I should say, I deal with acute medical intervention, not surgical intervention and other specialties. We do acute medical intervention extremely well, and we can do therapy, physical therapy assessments, but I can't intervene from a therapy standpoint very well. We don't have the staff. We're not designed to do therapies and recovery from acute illness. Patients get acutely sick, they come in the hospital, we force them to lay in a very uncomfortable bed, right? We have them stare at a sterile white ceiling, and we interrupt their sleep cycle with bells and noises and people coming in to check vital signs. Um, off, and they get deconditioned. Acute illness causes deconditioning, laying in bed causes deconditioning. And oftentimes, I have to get people out of the hospital in order to get the next phase of their care to truly get them better. So oftentimes, it's getting them to a rehab facility, a skilled facility where they are focused in those arenas at the, at the rehab, the physical recovery from the acute illness. And I dictate that care, medications, interventions in that transition. Absolutely. So, um, are you uh, have you witnessed? Are you familiar with um, delirium that occurs in the hospital? And is Absolutely. that another reason you want to kind of push them? Out, well, not push them out the door, but you want them to no. get back to normalcy. Yes. yes. So, as our patients get older. <laughs> As I get older, I like to tell all my patients, we are all aging at the exact same pace. Some of us are just a little farther down the path. And I'm ahead of many people. So as I get older, um, delirium is a very interesting, normal, what I would call a normal physiologic continuum. All of us have been traveling at some point in our lives, been in a hotel room, and awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, and suddenly we don't know where we are. Right? It takes us a few minutes to say, hey, wait a second, I'm on I-83, I'm in such and such a town and I'm traveling there. And we reorient, we go back to bed. In the hospital, you layer on sights and sounds that are abnormal, you layer on, layer on acute illness, and in the older population, this tends to get a little bit more amplified. And you can have a confused state called delirium. It is very much environmental. It needs to be addressed, and, and as hospital physicians, we're aware of how to intervene with this, knowing that if you've got to be in a hospital for four days, and this happened on day one, I've got to be able to manage it until I can get them to an environment where the normalcy of their lives, the visual input, the auditory input, the tactile input, can reorient them. Absolutely. So there's a lot of reasons to get patients through the institution efficiently, and it's not just money. It's not just one. Uh, it is for patient care. We're very aware of the, of the stages that patients need to go through to get better. And when it's no longer appropriate to be in the hospital, then I'm motivated to get them out. And that includes two, three dispositions. One, two we just spoke about. A skilled facility, meaning a rehab facility, because they need the physical rehab. Home is the, is the second. Oftentimes, patients will ask me, Dr. Fulton, shouldn't I be in Boston? Should I be at a different hospital? And my answer is either yes or no. And I said, as soon as I can't provide the level of care you need here, you're going someplace, okay? Whether you like it or not. You can choose which hospital, north to Dartmouth, south to Boston, it doesn't matter. But if I can't deliver the care that you need here, with all of the resources that I have, and I've got a lot of resources, Concord Hospital has been very committed to providing a high acuity level of care to our patients, but there's stuff that we simply don't do. And if a patient gets to that point, I'm on the phone and I'm telling them that they need to go. They can walk and say, absolutely not. That's, that's their choice. And then we talk about the decisions and consequences to their answer. So, Three dispositions, either you're going to a higher level of care, 
you're going to a rehab facility to get stronger before you get to go home. But now the impetus to get the patient out of the hospital quickly is somewhat driven by the insurance. It is. Yes, yes, and no. I guess would be my answer. Explain the no. Okay. Um, it is driven by insurance. It is driven by using our resources appropriately in the hospital. It is the awareness of that if you don't get them out in a timely fashion, there are other patients that need the resources that don't have access to them. So we're managing populations as much as we're managing individuals. And now I'm taking it up a level to a, a little bit more of a global. It is about, from my standpoint, being mindful of documenting what I'm doing, the acuity of our patients, so that the record reflects the service that we're delivering in the hospital. It is also partnering with those other facilities um, in our community that can take care of the same level of patients and provide a service that I can. I'm talking acute rehab, whether it's health south or skilled facilities. Um, financially, our organization does have to be mindful of finances. If we don't have the finances, we can't provide the care to our patients. So how do we use that resource? And managed care, managed care was a huge driver of this. And if you go back far enough, you remember this terrible term called capitation, right? You put the, put the onus on the physician to manage X number of dollars and to provide that care to the entire, uh, their entire panel of patients. Um, so it's being, it's being good stewards of the resources that we have, of the organization that invests in us and the partnership that we have in the medical community to our patients. So um, while Moving them through from a clinical standpoint, and the reason I say no, is that I don't manage my patients day to day based on a length of stay. I manage my patients day to day on the acuity of their illness. And I make that clinical decision as to when it's safe for them to transition to whatever the next level of care is. The hospital has to manage all of the other stuff. But I can tell you, with great confidence, certainty, and from my core that I have never had anybody in the hospital do anything except say thank you when I make a clinical decision. Okay, so the organization, while they need to manage the resources, and it's a community resource, from a clinician standpoint, I'm given liberty to leverage my education in my medical management. Um, so I don't feel that pressure to discharge at a certain time. When they track it, I say it's a clinical reason they need to stay, they say, okay. Clinical reason, doctor. As I like to say, it doesn't work too often, but, because Dr. Fulton said so. Right? <laughs> never, that, that doesn't work anywhere else, except in this one case. They can't go home today, why? Clinical reason. Check, thank you, okay? So that's the no piece, and that's from the practice of medicine. But as a practical matter, you're an employee of the hospital. Right? Yes, yes. Hunter Hospital doesn't look very favorable at all. Not, not true. Oh, not wait, true. no, no. Well, that's, yeah, I wouldn't say that at all. That's part of what we yeah. do. Yes. That's, our yeah. that's like and, and, more. <laughs> and, and the, the uncompensated care, now you're taking it up even a higher level because our patients come from different reimbursements. But the point being is that this partnership between the hospital and physicians, and I would say it's a, it's a partnership, especially with hospital based physicians, because we understand. We understand these drivers, the management, uh, the managed care piece, the quality and safety, efficiency is, is a keystone to what we do, and leveraging technology for it. The hospital is committed to giving me the resources necessary to take care of the patients appropriately, as efficiently as possible. And I get to, I get to a certain extent, get to define what that efficiency is. Um, so, and that includes giving a lot of care to those who don't have insurance, as well as those that have three-ish different tiers of insurance. 
and we give we, we provide the same load. And that's why I love not knowing what kind of patient it is, what kind of what kind of insurance they have. Because my focus from a clinical standpoint is to manage that patient to my commitment of medicine and to caring for patients, which is why I went into this profession to take care of patients. And and I wouldn't be here if the hospital didn't support me in that, by the way. And that's as a hospitalist, what I didn't talk about is if I go back to starting the program in 2002 in Nashville, there was a phase in that development of that program where I had to justify every physician that I wanted to hire because it was seen as an expense, right? Provided the service I had, and it was painful because that's not what you want to do as a physician. All I knew is that I needed more partners. There was an evolution where this partnership, the hospital, understood, and it took about three-ish years, where, remember I said I started thinking I needed six partners, then I needed eight, and 10, and 16. It got to the point where the hospital saw my value in what I did, and they were demanding that I hire. I no longer had to justify. I couldn't keep up with the demand, which is why which is why this happened right here. Because the hospitals understood their need for inpatient management because of the acuity and efficiency, the external pressures on hospitals to provide care. And suddenly, as you can see, the hospitals started demanding that we hire more inpatient-focused physicians. And even in Nashua, I never looked at insurance. And the hospital never asked me about it. And they've never asked me about it here either. And, 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 and nobody from, I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it would seem unlikely that anybody from the hospital would come to you and say, Dr. Fulton, you need to discharge that patient because insurance is no longer paid. No, it hasn't, it hasn't happened in over four years. And we do have efficiency um, project improvements, process improvements in the hospital. And back to my comment, they can't go because Dr. Fulton said so. When we define, we're looking for barriers, system barriers, patients getting out at the right time. It may not be a clinical decision, it may be some other, maybe, maybe medication, maybe, maybe trans, transition of care, something else. Or I ordered a test that didn't get done in a timely fashion, therefore they couldn't go. The hospital looks at those things, not to tell me what to do, but, to, but rather to make sure that they are providing the services around me to deliver the care that I need to deliver. So the hospital wants to make sure that in this partnership, they're not the ones being being responsible for the delays. That's why when I get to say, Dr. Fulton says so, and that's the only time I ever get to say it, it's clinical, right? I'm making a clinical decision today that this patient can or can't leave. The hospital is making sure they're doing, in this partnership, that they're pulling their weight as well. And the commitment is to our patients, period. Independent of their ability to pay. Yes, ma'am. All I can say is I know that the hospital is very supportive of anyone, and no one has ever denied care, or there there's no uncompensated care doesn't come into the issue. There's another. We raise money in philanthropy to support care for everyone who needs it. And let, me, let me please say thank you. All right. And there are those who, who we know just over time, just by virtue of their illnesses and what they have and their age and those sorts of things, we know they don't have insurance. And they come in with great regularity. Um, and we still take care of them, but we never say no. But, but I think something Mary said is really important is you talked about need. Need versus want. Right. And so you're, you know, if you, your focus is on their need. What is their need for medical care versus what do they want? Right. Which might be, I really do want to stay here for 10 days because I just don't want to go back and have to face laundry. But right. that's not a need. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes I'll offer to write a prescription that says no laundry. <laughs> Usually it's not to be gender specific, it's the guys that don't want to do the dishes. <laughs> kind of make them be my patient back rubs. They got, they got musculoskeletal problems. Yes, and, and, and if I go back far enough in my career, 
there was a time when patients would come in and demand things. And you walked away feeling like, you know, it was a la carte. That they simply came in and they put down whatever card or no card that they had and said, this is what I want. I'm not going to leave until I get it. I think we're past that a little bit. But we're still making decisions based on medical need independent of the ability to pay. And, and for those who have given, I can only say thank you because it makes my ability to deliver care much easier because I have resources that many other hospitals don't have. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. One last question. One last question. One last question. Well, uh, your, your ability to deliver services depends on the adequacy of the hospital. Absolutely. Uh, you must, uh, must be aware of how adequate this hospital is. The last two times I needed hospital services, the problem of where to put you know, the hospital, the hospital was full. Right. So, what is the situation now? Are you on the hospital capacity? I mean, even in a time when we're not having apparently any great acute need in the community, we're still a full. Yes, sir. So are we going to have to expand pretty quite a bit? That is a question for someone else in the organization, <laughs> but my answer is absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, we run a capacity quite a bit. We absolutely do. Um, when you deliver good care, people want to use it. And there are people that drive past three other hospitals to get here, by the way. Um, there are patients that have told me in having been sent down to Boston for reasons that they needed to be there, we accepted them and transferred back here. And I got to take care of them. The first statement out of the family member's mouth and the patient was, thank you. Thank you for taking me back here. I get so much better care here than I did in Boston. Okay? That's a quote. So, but because of that, the hospital is very full. It absolutely is. Um, it's significantly busier than it was four and a half years ago when I started. Yes, it absolutely is. Yes, sir. I have lived long enough to have the benefit of remembering when there was a hospital in Concord called the Margaret Pillsbury. <laughs> oh boy, that is a long time. And it was on Pillsbury Street. Mm -hmm. And all I want to tell you is if you can remember those days at the Margaret Pillsbury Hospital and remember and look at what we have now for a facility in our community, everybody ought to feel very, very good about what's happened for the community as it relates to medical coverage. Absolutely. My wife and I are in a position right now of having to face the reality of whether we're going to go to Florida this winter. And the reason is, at our health, at our age, if I get acutely ill, I want to be here. <clears throat> and if I get acutely ill in Englewood, Florida, I want to come home for the treatment. <laughs> so, from my perspective, what is available to this community now, in this hospital, is better than you can ever imagine. I am a participant in it. I'm one who has been involved in it. And all I can tell you is it starts at the patient center. This community has an awful lot of, of availability of services. Does. And we all should be very grateful for it. Yes. And, and I am grateful for it as well because it allows me to practice the medicine the way I was trained to my level where I want to practice it. And I've got additional resources that allow me to be comfortable doing that. We have, we've got a very good medical staff and it's a very good hospital. So thank you all for staying. Thank you.